In this video, I'll be installing some rubber matting to my workshop floor. This project did not go well initially, but more on that later. There'll also be a bit of woodworking as I need to make a new wooden threshold for underneath my PVC doors. So the main reason I decided to lay rubber matting is because I found that standing on a concrete floor all day really takes its toll on my legs and feet. At my old workshop, which had a wooden floor, I could work much longer hours without feeling fatigued with aches and pains. Also, one of my block planes slipped off the workbench at one point onto the concrete floor and this piece that holds the lever cap in place broke. So a rubber floor is going to be easier on anything that happens to get dropped. Aside from that, the concrete floor was pretty ugly too. It was a mixture of old concrete with badly worn out paint and new concrete, which I recently laid to cover over an inspection pit that was in the workshop in a recent video. And by the way, since that video, I also mixed up some floor leveling compound to lay over the new concrete slab, just to help get the new concrete nice and level with the old concrete floor. And that worked out really nicely, but if I could give one tip about using this stuff if you've not used it before, it would be to mix it wetter than you think you need to. In the past, I'd always mixed it slightly too thick and you really want it to be a thin, soupy consistency so that it self-levels properly. And you can then just push it around with a trowel and leave it alone to level off. This project actually began many months ago when I first got the rubber matting delivered. I'll talk about which rubber matting I chose, plus the things I like and dislike about it, and the costs associated with this project later in the video. So back then, I thought I could simply lay it out on the floor, cut it to size, and that would be that. I figured it would be heavy enough to stay put without needing to be glued down. If I didn't have anything on wheels, I think it would have been okay, but I have my large assembly table, my planer, my belt and disc sander, my table saw, my band saw and a dust extractor all on wheels and I quickly learned that moving any of those things around in the workshop caused the mat to ruck up. Is ruck a word? I think ruck is a word. Anyway, here's what I mean. Hopefully you can see the problem. At one point I tried adding some gaffer tape in between the seams of where one mat met the next but that didn't work well enough either so I started doing a bit of research into adhesives and originally I decided to get this stuff, VS90 Plus by Mapi, or Mapi, I'm not sure how you say it, but it's relatively inexpensive when compared to some of the other options. It's also acrylic based rather than solvent based, which means it doesn't give off smelly fumes. So no need to wear a respirator and it's environmentally friendly. It's designed to be troweled on and having watched a really good video on YouTube about how to use a similar product, which I'll link to in the description box below, I was convinced that it was a good choice. I also spoke to Mappe or Mappy via Twitter to ask if it would adhere well to both the old concrete and the new leveling compound over the pit. And they said, yes, it would. So I bought two five kilogram tubs, which would have been enough to cover the entire floor of my workshop. I also bought the recommended size trowel from Amazon to apply it. You'll see it has small notches to spread out the glue so that a little goes a long way. I'll leave links to all of the products I use in the description box below this video if you're interested. I decided that before applying the adhesive to one of the rubber mats that I'd cut a small piece of rubber off cuts and test the adhesive out just to see how well it would hold. And this is where I encountered my first issue. After applying the adhesive, you're meant to wait for it to go tacky before applying the rubber. And it's meant to take about 10 minutes at a temperature of around 15 degrees Celsius. To test if it's tacky, you can touch it with your fingers and if the adhesive transfers onto your skin, then it's not yet tacky enough. I checked repeatedly every 10 minutes for an hour and the glue still had not gone tacky. It was about 10 degrees Celsius in my workshop on this day, so I knew it wasn't going to go tacky as quickly as it should, but you can see here that I've got an oil-filled radiator on full heat right next to the adhesive and after about an hour, it still was not tacky enough. So I resorted to heating the adhesive with my heat gun and after maybe two minutes of that, the adhesive finally felt tacky enough, so I applied the rubber and it seemed to grab pretty well immediately. I left it alone for about a day and then came back to see how well stuck down it was. And it seemed like it worked pretty well, so then I scraped away the adhesive with a bolster just to clean it off the concrete. So I was pretty concerned at this point that using the adhesive in the winter here in the UK onto a cold concrete surface wasn't going to go particularly well, but I'd already opened the tub and I knew I wasn't going to be able to return it, so I decided I'd wait for a warmer day and then just leave it for longer in the hope that it would go tacky. 
The best opportunity I got was a day when it was 13 degrees Celsius and again I got the radiator on to heat up the space as much as possible and I started to clear the space ready to start gluing down the mat. When I lifted the mats that were already laid down I found that a lot of the old paint on the concrete in that area was in better condition than the rest of the floor and I wasn't sure if the adhesive would be able to adhere to that painted surface so I decided to give it a little bit of sanding using a coarse grit in the belt sander Removing all of the paint would have been far too much work without using an industrial sized sander but I figured that at least scuffing it up a little to cut through some of that paint would be a good idea. I could then roll out the first mat and position it. I added some masking tape at the edges so that the adhesive that I apply would not go beyond where I wanted it. I could then fold half of that mat back on itself and start sweeping both the back of the matting and the concrete floor as it's important that both surfaces are free of any dust and debris. To help protect my knees I made some knee pads using some packaging foam and gaffer tape. I know it looks silly but kneeling on concrete is not good for your knees. I then gave the adhesive a good stir as recommended on the container and started to trowel it on and I'm trying to apply it as thinly and evenly as possible. When I got to the end I scooped up the excess to put it back in the pot so as not to waste it. And then I waited and checked and waited and checked and waited and checked and it just would not go tacky. I gave it about three hours and still very little tackiness. The adhesive had started to go a little translucent which is a good sign that it was curing very very slowly but it still didn't seem tacky enough to adhere to the rubber. So I resorted to the heat gun again concentrating on those areas that were less translucent until they were tacky enough. It seemed like the only option I had to speed up the process and then I could roll the mat onto the adhesive bit by bit. This was a very slow and annoying process and needless to say by this point I knew I was going to need to use a different adhesive for this job. To be honest even if it was the peak of summer here in the UK I'd be surprised if the concrete would ever be warm enough for this adhesive to go tacky as quickly as the 10 minutes that it suggests on the container. I spoke to Mape, Mapi, Mapai again about this over the phone to ask for advice. I explained the situation and their best advice was to buy a halogen heater to heat up the concrete. I'd already spent £50 on the adhesive and trowel and I didn't really want to invest in a heater just to get this glue to cure so maybe this product is okay for some applications in a heated home for example but for this kind of job it just isn't going to cut the mustard. So I'd spent an entire day by this point and I'd only managed to lay half of one of the floor mats which was pretty disappointing but on the plus side the adhesive did seem to grip well enough especially after all of that heat gun action and I applied some downward pressure using a brush to make sure that all of the rubber was in contact with the adhesive and to ensure that there was no air trapped underneath. And this tip of using a brush was another thing I picked up from that video that I mentioned earlier on, link to that below. I started researching adhesives at this point, asking on a few online forums and I got quite a few suggestions but to be honest none of them really appealed to me. Most of the suggestions fell into three categories. Firstly Colt Gun construction adhesive products which I didn't really want to use because I wanted an even coverage of adhesive across the entire floor rather than beads of adhesive to stop the mats being able to ruck up. Secondly spreadable contact adhesives which are solvent based which would have cost an absolute fortune for the quantity I needed to do the entire floor. And thirdly more of the acrylic based options that I figured would just have the same issue as the stuff that I'd already tried. Then I remembered I had some spray contact adhesive in the workshop so I decided to test that out on some of the rubber matting too just to see how well it would adhere. In my experience these spray cans are much easier to work with than the spreadable stuff anyway and also the coverage seems pretty good. A little goes a long way so it seemed worth a try. I stuck that down and a couple of hours later I came back to find that it worked really well. It was a much better bond than the Mapai Mapi Mapai product I'd used. I had a couple of cans so I figured I may as well get on and lay some smaller mats underneath and either side of my mitre station. So I cut some pieces of the rubber to size using a sharp knife and a straight edge. 
swept the areas clean and applied the spray adhesive to both the concrete floor and the back of the rubber mats. I was far too generous with the glue here, later I realised I didn't need to use nearly as much as this to get a great bond. This stuff goes tacky in about 3 or 4 minutes and then it's ready to apply. Because here I'm working in a bit of an awkward corner, I used some sticks in between the two glued surfaces to stop them sticking. That gave me a chance to position it correctly and then I could smooth it out with my hands. And again I used the brush again to push it down. To hide any gaps around the edges of the room where my cuts weren't perfect, I cut down some bits of architrave that I had left over from the works in our house to make some skirting boards. These were just pinned in place with a few brad nails and then I applied a bead of white silicon on top. Once all of the mitre station bits were in and done, I could finish off gluing down the rest of the mat that I'd started with the VS90 stuff. This spray contact adhesive is pretty smelly and you're not really meant to breathe it in, so I had a respirator on and both of my workshop doors open in an attempt to get the air flowing through as much as possible. When I ran out of the spray adhesive that I had, I still hadn't found any better adhesive options to try, and I figured that as it was working so well and going quite quickly, I just went and bought another 12 cans of it, which worked out to be just about the right amount to finish off what I'd started. All of the mats I'd laid up until now had been in the workshop for several months, and before I could start laying down the newer mats, which were still on the rolls, it was important to let them acclimatise to the room that they are going to be laid in. So I unwrapped them, rolled them out flat, and left them alone for a couple of days. I also had to cut one of my mats in around this pillar, and cutting it all out of one piece seemed like it would be too tricky to lay, so I did it in two pieces instead, using a straight edge to cut them so that they would line up without too much of a big ugly gap. This didn't need to be perfect, it just needs to be functional. It's just a workshop after all, and it's going to get lots of spills, scrapes, and scars over the years, I'm sure. At this point I'd already ditched using the masking tape to get things nice and neat and tidy. I just wanted to get this project done to be honest. I was pretty relieved to be getting on to laying the last mat but the floor was particularly dirty in that area. Sweeping wasn't really doing enough so I went over it all with a wet towel and then let it dry before laying the final mat. And this one needed to be cut down to width as well as length and to be cut in around the pillars. Each few minutes of waiting for the glue to go tacky was an opportunity to browse Instagram. By the way, you can follow me at Rag and Bone Brown to see what I'm working on before the videos come out. Pressing the mats down was also an opportunity for me to work on my moonwalk. Michael Jackson's shoes never had to contend with rubber mats though. The final job was to sort out this area by the door. I had already removed the old rubber door seals earlier. I decided I'd make a little wooden door threshold instead to cover the edge of the mat and help seal underneath the doors. I've got some of this salvaged mahogany, I think it is, found by a church that was being refurbished a few years back. First I ripped it down to width at the table saw, and then by taking multiple passes at the table saw and raising the blade in between each cut, I got it down to the thickness I wanted. Then I could cut it to length at the mitre saw. I trimmed away some of the excess rubber and took some measurements and then figured out the profile shape that I wanted to cut into it. And then I can start marking up the shape I wanted to cut. This slope here is going to make it easier to wheel things in and out of the workshop on the rare occasion that I need to. This bit here is for the door to close onto and it'll help seal the door to cut down on noise and drafts coming in. And this bit will go over the rubber mat. I made the cuts using the table saw just by lining up the blade with the marks I've made by eye and again taking multiple passes just to make the cuts easier on the saw. And all the final shaping was done using my hand plane and block plane. This is how it ended up looking. I drilled some holes through it so I could secure it to the floor. I then offered it up and closed the doors just to get the correct placement of it as I wanted the doors to butt right up to it. Here I'm using a masonry bit just to mark up where the holes in the concrete would need to be drilled. 
And then we use the SDS drill to drill the holes to the depth needed. And then I could add some raw plugs and screws. I also needed to drill a hole in order for the door to lock into the threshold at the bottom so that it locked properly. And I applied three coats of finish. This stuff is an exterior wood stain and varnish in one, which I've had in the workshop for a while, so it was nice to finally find a use for it. And that's it done. Finally, I'm going to talk about some of the good and the bad things about the matting I chose and also the costs of the project. One of the most common questions I've been asked is how easy this stuff is to clean because of the ribs in the matting. I tend to brush up any shavings or big bits of debris and then I use a vacuum for the dust and using the brush setting on the bottom of the head works best. Dust can be swept but one of the downsides of having those ribs is that you can only really brush in the direction of the ribs. If you go the other way it doesn't really work because the dust gets trapped in between the ribs. Not a big issue for me but if you're more of a sweeper you can get different designs of rubber that aren't ribbed but they tend to be a bit more expensive and I also like the idea of the ribs because I think it makes for more of a cushioned feel underfoot so for me it was the best cheap option available. Is it hard wearing? Yes, definitely, it's really robust. I was able to drag my heavy workbench from the concrete floor onto the mat and it didn't tear or anything. It's good stuff, very grippy. I've spilt chemicals on it, dropped things on it, dragged stuff over it and no issues at all. Apparently it also helps insulate the space. I can't imagine it makes a huge difference to be honest. I haven't noticed it being much warmer in the workshop, but who knows. I have noticed it's helped a lot with acoustics because now there are less hard surfaces for sound to reverberate from so if I record audio in the workshop it sounds better. It'll also help in terms of noise coming from the workshop because the rubber cushions any vibrations from using any of my machines. Noise isn't an issue for me here though because I'm next to a busy road which tends to be much noisier than any noise I'm likely to make in my fully insulated garage so my neighbours aren't really going to hear me anyway but if you're working in a shed in a residential area like I used to be then it's definitely going to help with that. Now on to the costs. The total cost of the rubber matting was £209. The width of the roll is 1.2 meters and the thickness of the rubber that I chose was three millimeters. You can get thicker options than that, but again, I was on a tight budget. I bought it on Amazon and I'll leave links to it in the description box below and to some alternatives to the rib design too. The original adhesive I tried was 20 pounds. I bought two pots, which was 40 pounds, but got one refunded once I realized it wasn't going to work. The trowel was 12 pounds on Amazon, link to that is below too. And the spray adhesive I used was from Screwfix. It's £3.79 a can, and I used 14 cans, which in total was about £53. The architrave that I used as skirting was from Wix. It's already fully primed and painted, and for five 2.1 meter lengths, it was about £26. And I used two packs, which works out about £53. Obviously, I could have made my own skirting boards, but for the time it would have taken to prime, wait for it to dry, and then paint, and wait for that to dry. Honestly, I was just happy to pay for it. So in total, it worked out to just under 350 pounds. That's about $456. It was not an enjoyable project at all, mainly because of the initial adhesive issues, wasting so much of my time, but I'm really glad it's done now and I'm really happy with it. I have no idea how long it took. I lost track to be honest, but I'm going to guess at maybe about three days. But a lot of that time was spent moving things around to clear the floor and cleaning and there was a lot of laying out mats and waiting for them to acclimatize too so it tied up the workshop for over a week in total which meant I couldn't really work on anything else at the time. So that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed the video or at least found it useful. Please subscribe to my channel for more weekly woodworking videos. You can also support the channel on Patreon if you'd like to where you can get early access to my videos, some exclusive content free project plans and cut lists and a name credit at the end of my videos. Thank you for watching.